we have another session, The World Outside of Archives. And, and our first speaker, it's um, Peter Bubenstinger. And he's from um, AVRD, specializing in open source preservation. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Peter. So let's get right to the point. I'm speaking about open source and long term. It's not only about long term preservation, but like integrating open source in your institution or even privately long term. Because, yeah. I was inspired to give this presentation by giving another presentation in Frankfurt a few months ago where I said, open source and free software, it's awesome, you can do stuff, you can do magic, and it empowers a handful of people to do stuff that was said to be impossible as a proof of concept, F 1.3 as we know it today. And then in the audience, an archivist, she said, eh, we used open source, you say it's awesome, but we tried it and it didn't work as well because it didn't have the features, it was too complicated, we would need hackers, we don't know stuff. So we went back to the proprietary version of the tool that we tried to save money with. Um, so this is why I say just using open stuff. When I say open stuff is cool and awesome, it can do things, there are some things to keep in mind to actually um, unravel the power, I'm not sure if I use the words correctly. It might even make things worse if you don't do it right. But to be reminded, this applies to non-free systems as well. Like if somebody says, here's a farm, you get it for free, it's like, cool, but how do you run a farm? How do you deal with stuff? You've got running costs and whatever, and just getting stuff. Like the initial, like, here's a big boat, you can have it for free. Here's a Ferrari, you can have it for free. But can you maintain it? Can you actually work with it? So, popular mistakes that I encounter when I work with archiving institutions or other non-archiving institutions that use open source. The first one is they underestimate environmental conditions and starting conditions. We'll get into the details of this, but that's a popular mistake. And another one, which is very important, but it goes to the direction why people call me an open source evangelist, because you have to go into asking, why are you wanting to use open stuff in the first place? Do you value it or just going for, I need something cheap or for free? A major thing is that there is no continuous allocation of resources planned. It's like, now we got the big Ferrari for free, dude. And then in the first maintenance service, they go like, oh God, we don't know how to fix it, how to maintain it, how to whatever. So that's a big issue. And another one is, oh yeah, the open source stuff, it's maintained by the community. Problem solved. We're just using it. We're not the community. They're, they are. Who's the community? That's like, like somebody's going to fix the problem, not us. We're not a coder. We're not involved in this at all. We're just users. We just lean back and enjoy whatever the developers bring to us. So what are reasons or maybe your reasons to use free and open source software? I use the term FOSS um, a lot. So don't be confused by this. So one, that's a major one I get. People approach me and go like, hey, your company is specializing on free software stuff. So you know we need a free alternative for this because we actually don't have enough budget to get the real stuff that all the other kids on the block are using. Or, hey, dude, your stuff's for free, right? That's great because then we save the money to buy the proprietary system. I recently had to say, like, we're so tight on budget and so on, which is really true. And then they told me because they have to pay several thousands of euros for a lock-in system, so they want to save the money by not paying for anything open. The third one, hardly seen, unfortunately, um, unless people have understood what free as in freedom in free software is about. It's they need to adapt systems. They need to keep systems alive. When we're in preservation, I mean, when I was working in audio preservation, I don't think I've seen a single audio replayer machine that wasn't hacked. 
like they got the schematics, they did, they, they modified it, they kind of like made different parts to keep it alive, especially with older equipment like gramophones, you know. There's no company to go to anymore to like, hey, you built that system, give me a new one or fix it. So you needed these freedoms to use study share and improve software to be able to actually keep software and digital systems alive. Like in a building, if a building was built in 1900 something, um, and then you add water supply or heating and so on, you kind of hack the building. You don't tear it down and replace it completely. Like national libraries would look different if you didn't have the use, study, share, and improve freedoms in the real world. So when they say, it's very often, it's like, we want to get the free stuff because we can't afford the real stuff. But let's take a look at how you may define free or real, like, that's what everybody's using. That's like the real thing and that's like the cheap alternative. But you can have a different look because free, of course, first one is free as in free beer. The other one's like, yeah, we got the free stuff, but it's, we know it's unprofessional. Come on, we got it for free. What do we expect? Nothing. Um, it's not really as reliable or awesome. Even if it was, people assume it's not. I can tell you of a lot of costly proprietary systems that have bugs and issues. Any system has the best system. No system is flawless, but any software is just as good as you expect it to be. Then it's like, it can't be as good as non-free. That's why I put in worth less than non-free water. I like to use the image of water because who of you thinks that water is better if it's non-free? Hands up. Who of you thinks water should actually be as free and accessible for everyone? Okay, who of you is not raising their hands? I will ask you questions <laughs> later. But okay, so there, the freedom to use, study, share, and improve, it's hardly noticed when people go for free. And another thing is considered as a part of a digital commons infrastructure. We'll also get to this later. Compared to the real thing, it's often associated with a really good PR, and it's like, we would like to have it, but we can't afford it. So like the Ferrari, you would like to have it. I wouldn't want to have it, by the way. But um, some people do just because it's, they can't have it. It's like what you can't have, it's like the carrot in front of your face. And the other thing, what I really heard a lot, but it's gotten better, is like, come on, open source, Pff, never heard of FFmpeg. How can it be professional? <laughs> Unless you discovered that the pros are actually using it, but they're just not telling you. Um, or it's like the number one that everyone uses. You don't want to be alone out there. You don't want to be like, I use something else than everybody else. Like if I have an issue, like it's just my problem. If everybody else has a blue screen of death, it's like, ah, oh, all of us have this problem. It doesn't work for none of us. Um, I want the one with the great graphical user interface. It's, it's very important, or the well-supported one. Like you get free software and you're like nobody to call, nobody to care of. You go like, I would like to have this and that. And like nobody answers. They go like, yeah, why should I bother as a developer? So keep these things in mind when you think about what's free and what's non-free. So what if um, the real stuff, like this is what the people use, the professional stuff, if that was actually free, free as in freedom and free as in free beer or either or. Is there any reason not to want that? Does anybody not want to get the most awesome piece of software or digital system as free software? Anybody want, doesn't want this? Okay, thank you. Um, that should, like, is that, would that be worth something to you to be able to have like, wow, we get free water out of the pipes, drinking water quality for everyone. It has to be paid somehow, that's infrastructure. Um, but would you expect it to be as good as the non-free one? We've had that before. Now, with these bold things, people go like, yeah, but that's not possible, come on. You can't stuff, get stuff for free, otherwise it would be free. Like, how's it work? That's a forest, a huge one. And um, when I come to situations where, that's why I say the starting conditions and environmental conditions matter. I say, if we go open source and we build a system where we use a system and we improve this and it's built on open technology, it might not be um, 
turnkey ready yet, but maybe a base to start from, or maybe it is already there. But imagine a tree, a forest. I go like, a forest? That's bloody amazing. It's like, you've got a self-sustaining ecosystem, like the leaves drop down, they rot, worms, bacteria, and so on. It's, it blows your mind. You don't even have to be on a trip to, <laughs> I mean, seriously, go to a forest. It's like, how the fuck does this work? So, going back to software, it's like, all right, you say open source can do this and that. It's amazing. It's like a forest. Sounds magic to me. You've never seen a forest. I don't believe in forests. It sounds too good to be true. Here, you got a highway road. We won't stop traffic for your communist experiment. Go and plant your tree seeds there. Show us the forest. Starting conditions matter. So, this is... <laughs> This tree might have a chance to grow. <laughs> Let, it probably won't become a forest, but I think you get the idea. You know, it's like if you plant a tree somewhere, it matters how and how much resources it has and so on, and if there are cars driving over the small tree or if cars try to hit a big tree. So the longer the forest has to evolve and be around in a good environment, the more stable it gets. And that's where it actually unleashes its ecosystem, self-sustaining, self-repairing powers. Speaking of roads, um, a lot of open source code is actually all over the place. If we would have a magic button that says, remove all source code, like open source tools from our taken for, as this is the 21st century infrastructure, foop, wouldn't like, you'd have no internet. You'd not have a lot of things that currently just function because open source became kind of like infrastructure. And there's a book written called Roads and Bridges, thanks to Bert from Pact, who pointed this out at the FIAF conference. And it's about the unseen labor behind these things. And that a lot of open source is there and we need it, but there's no plans or hardly any plans how to actually put this into a maintenance schedule, like how to integrate this long term, how to allocate resources and time and so on to keep the roads and bridges actually in function. And roads and bridges, of course you have tolls for roads and bridges, but most of them should be freely accessible to the public and they should never be I hope it will never be the case to take a like, you can only drive on this road if you have a car from manufacturer A, B, or C. No other choice. Roads won't work with any other car. But that's what we find in software world. So infrastructure. Well, in the real world, they're mostly, partially, at least to a certain point that we can live, covered by taxes. Um, what's really good is that the trend became, like, it became obvious that it's necessary if you have publicly funded code and projects that if the code goes proprietary, it's like you're leaking out public budget into private pockets. That's not really good for the community and not really good for the public. So if there is a public funded project, it's very often that it says, but it has to be released under a free and open source license. But what we figured out in the last few years is working with governmental institutions, they're sometimes not allowed to pay for open source tools they would want to use or they use or they rely on. They're not allowed to buy rules that were designed for proprietary systems. For example, you're only allowed to pay a support contract up to a percentage of the initial license fee. Now, if the license cost is zero, guess what the maximum amount of support contract that you can handle, uh, that you can, um, uh, that you're allowed, to, like, okay, um, zero, zero, like percent of, five percent of zero, so, so you get it. So there's a project called, the slogan is public money, public code, and there's a link there. Um, it's about uh, writing letters to governmental officials to kind of raise the awareness of that this actually, on the long term, is necessary and makes sense. <clears throat> but, when I say, but there are open source projects publicly funded, some people go, for a good reason, yeah, but after the project's over, poo, nobody cares. The, the code's there, it becomes abandoned. Um, you've got orphan projects, nice that it's open source, but there's no one behind there anymore. It's like a building that just falls to pieces because software doesn't just stay there without maintenance. 
because the world around changes. You can have a perfectly good software, three years old, five years old, the whole digital environment changes. So the software will suddenly be shifted out of its functionality. But no developer likes to give up their project. Hardly ever, even if they lose interests. Um, so how do we make sure this doesn't happen? Because that's important. So there's like top reasons for a fast developer to leave a project. The first one is lack of interest. Yes, there are a lot of projects where somebody's like, cool, I could hack something cool together. Wow, proof of concept, next. Um, been there, done that. Now you, you have it, world, please, here, I've proven it. Go on, make the rest. Um, lack of patience, that's actually, if you read the source that I quote, it's lack of patience with the users. Uh, they go like, hey, you gave me free stuff. I, example from the real world with real stuff, I think the emotions and things that we have with this are more accurate. A friend of mine told me they had a lot of cherries this year, so they gave away cherries for free. They were organic, non-treated, whatever. So they go like, here, dear lady, you have a bucket of cherries. And she was like, thanks, went home, and then was like, they were worms in the cherries. I want to get a replacement for the warm cherries. Like, lady, you got them cherries for free because we shared it with you. And she's like, but I demand. And this happens to free software developers a lot. Jerome once posted a nice email he got from a user that really hurt. <laughs> Lack of resources, time, or money. If you're passionate about something, and believe me, free and open source developers are. Like, they know their stuff, and they want to do it, but they often, like, have to pay their rent and stuff. So lack of resources, time, and or money. Change of profession. Very often, this is because they also have to pay their rent. Um, creative differences, that's something that humans will always run into, <laughs> independent of a license. All these reasons, by the way, don't just apply to free and open source development. They apply to basically why you keep a job. <laughs> like, if you have a job and you're interested, you stay there, you have enough patience, whatever. But if the job can't pay what you, like pay your rent or whatever, you have to leave it. If you have creative differences with uh, where the company is going, you might leave the job or you stay because you have to because it pays your rent. So this is not only why free software projects stop, it's actually why humans stop doing things, even if they want to continue on them. So we have to make sure that these things stay good for the developers. Even if a developer is not interested in the project anymore, but there's funding and resources another developer can come up um, and say, hey, cool, I, I can pay my rent if I, if I do this, and um, I'm interested, so I take over your project. That, that happens, actually. Hmm. Taken for granted. Who of you is using all these tools that we've already heard in all the no time to waits and so on and so forth and also before lunch? Meet info, VLC, hands up. That's a lot. Like other way around, who's not using any open source at all? Yeah, that was a catch. <clears throat> what if these things disappear? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah, come on, Peter, rub it in, rub it in. But seriously. Like, what's your plan, or do you have plans, or what's your idea, or do you know how these projects stay alive? What, what makes them don't lose the patience? What makes them not lose interest? What makes their, is a sp like, spousal? I don't know if I'm using the word correctly, like husband or wife, or like their family go like, you could earn so much more money if you go on proprietary. They're making hell of a money and the people have to pay them. And you're doing what? You're doing good? I ain't seen any good. You're crying. You're coding code that people go like, yeah, but I want to have them without worms. <laughs> That's a real issue. So getting back to value, because it's an important starting point. As I said, if you get something for free, very often you go like, yeah, and if I throw it away, nothing lost. Um, I 
found out, or at least this is my personal impression, that when I try to come talk to people about like how to deal with software or machinery or electronics, they go like, Whoa, I'm not a technician. I actually do not care at all. I just want it to work full stop, one button, not more. And graphics, please, awesome. So let's map it onto something that you might be more familiar with, like running a house or food production. This is why this is like a cute image of a small self-sustaining homestead. Speaking about food, what would be your preference? Like industrial patent to lock in seeds, you can't grow them yourself, even though you've got the plants planted, but you can't use their seeds. And nature is there, nature's for free. Hell, we're gonna use nature until it drops. Uh, excellent. Um, versus organic sustainable community handmade. So who's, who's in for number one? Okay, questions. Which one's required? Initially I had like, which one's good for long term? I would say required for long term. Number one, hands up. Number two, I think you get the idea. Uh, which one's the current mainstream, number one? Yeah, if you go like, oh, I got a chicken, probably not the second one, probably the first one. Which profits whom? These are questions we don't have to answer them right now, but please play around. Answer these questions to yourselves. And which one has the shinier apples? Because that's an important one, because this is the perceived value. How do you perceive the value of immaterial goods like software? That was obvious. Come on, it's me. <laughs> so the first one maps to proprietary, and I'm not exaggerating. Please, try for yourself. And the second one maps to FOSS. We're almost done. Who's the community? The users are the community. If you're using something, if you want something, if you like something, you are the community. Not a coder can still contribute. It's with FF we won. I stumbled over it. I can write code, but this is way out of my league. Like FFmpeg developers, kudos. So I didn't code. What I did was I value FOSS. Like, it's supposed to be there because I want to have kids and they shall play with digital stuff and not be like, don't ask questions, just use it. I offered my time, basically. Um, I wrote some documentation, the FF1 cheat sheet, too short, but still there. Um, public tutorials, design graphics, testing, did a lot of testing, raising funds and demanding, like, hey, dear vendor, do you support this open format? If not, why not? These are things that you can do and you actually should do if you want to have free and open stuff in the future and now. So, summing it up, the environmental and starting conditions matter. If you have employees that go like, I don't like that free stuff, we want to have the real stuff, we don't want you saving money on us, <coughs> that's a bad starting condition. You gotta, like, there's a lot of things happening in the mind and there's other stuff happening in computers. Encourage and value digital freedoms, contribute if possible, and please allocate continuous resources and think long-term and in collaborations. Thanks a lot. Um, we, we have time for one short question. Very short, please. Hi, Martin Wrigley, Open Preservation Foundation. As, as you know, or if you were here this morning, uh, we uh, steward an awful lot of open source uh, of stuff exactly like that. We provide many of the things you're describing. We pick up orphans, orphans that the community needs. If there's one orphan we should be looking at to, to provide some oomph to, what would it be? I can't come up with anyone right now, but I'll think about it. I forgot to mention the OPF. I wanted to after his talk, by the way. So that was the one question, right? We're out of yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Thanks um, a lot. <laughs> and enjoy the show. Thank you very much.